Welcome to History of Health Information Technology in the U.S., Evolution of Public Health Informatics. This lecture focuses on the history and evolution of public health informatics. The objectives for this unit, Evolution of Public Health Informatics, are to discuss how the subdiscipline of public health informatics has evolved over time, describe how health IT or HIT can be used to enhance public health practice, list potential ethical, social, and political issues associated with development of HIT applications for public health purposes. First, we will define public health. Next, we will define and discuss public health informatics, or PHI. By describing the evolution of PHI, we will talk about what PHI professionals do, what early PHI applications were designed to do, and finally, we will describe both emerging and future PHI applications. The federal government describes the mission of public health as to promote physical and mental health and prevent disease injury and disability. This mission is accomplished by 10 essential services grouped under three main headings. Assessment includes monitoring health and diagnosing or investigating health problems. Monitoring health involves collecting detailed information about the incidence and prevalence of a myriad of diseases. Investigating health problems includes such activities as following up after foodborne outbreaks or identifying causes of cancer clusters in a given community. Policy development includes bullets 3, 4, and 5. Specifically, public health is responsible for educating citizens about health issues, mobilizing community resources to identify and responding to health problems, and developing policies that support individual and community health efforts. An example of a public health policy may be the mandated use of seatbelts. This law supports the individual's health and reduces community health burdens associated with morbidity and mortality from automobile crashes. The last five essential services are part of public health's assurance responsibilities. These include enforcing laws or regulations designed to preserve health or ensure safety, providing access to health care services as a last resort for individuals without access otherwise, training or providing continued professional education to the health care workforce, evaluating the accessibility and quality of population-based health services, and finally, conducting research on population health problems so that new solutions can be discovered. As can be seen by these 10 essential services, public health is very concerned with preventive rather than curative aspects of health. Moreover, public health is more concerned with issues that can affect communities or populations rather than individual-level health issues. Now that we know a little about public health, let's explore what PHI is. PHI came about when public health officials began utilizing health information technologies to support what they do. The responsibilities of public health are collectively referred to as public health practice. PHI has been defined by Freed et al. as the science of applying information age technology to serve the specialized needs of public health. PHI has also been defined by Yasnoff as the systematic application of information and computer science to public health practice, research, and learning. There are several ways PHI is different from other informatics disciplines. First, there's a focus on prevention and on populations. Second, given the broad nature of public health, there is a wide range of interventions that can be used to achieve the goals of PHI.
Lastly, public health operates almost entirely in a governmental context, either federal, state, or local levels of government. So unlike related informatics disciplines, PHI could be constrained by this governmental context. PHI professionals are usually individuals with backgrounds in both IT and public health. Typically, one requires a baseline amount of knowledge in both disciplines to take full advantage of PHI applications. Freed, one of the authors that provided a definition for PHI that we just reviewed, first described the need for PHI as a distinct field in 1995. While the PHI field gained some momentum in the late 1990s, it wasn't until 2001, with the events of 9-11 and the subsequent anthrax attacks, that the need for health IT applications specifically for public health purposes crystallized. These two major events reminded us how vulnerable we are and how important constant monitoring of health trends are to our ability to respond to bioterrorism. The U.S. War on Terror reminds us that individuals with the right expertise can use biological weapons to threaten the health of our nation's citizens. A major concern for public health practitioners in the U.S. involved a scenario where a biological weapon causes an outbreak of a silently communicable disease. In such a case, officials wouldn't even know the attack was going on until it was too late. Not surprisingly, early PHI applications were designed to monitor health trends so that a sudden spike in certain ailments could be investigated as a possible early warning of a biological attack. Such applications are referred to as syndromic surveillance. The definition of syndromic surveillance, according to Yan and colleagues, is the continuous monitoring of public health-related information sources and early detection of adverse disease events. More generally, syndromic surveillance utilizes computer systems, advanced statistical algorithms, and data visualization techniques to identify trends warranting the attention of public health officials. Some potential examples of possible data sources that can be used in syndromic surveillance include sales of over-the-counter drugs, for example, flu medications, which may signify early signs of a biological agent, and visits to the emergency department for certain respiratory issues. Non-clinical data can also be used to inform syndromic surveillance systems. For example, absentee data from schools, especially if much higher than normal, may provide clues alerting officials of a possible early warning sign of a potential biological attack in progress. Certainly, any single data source has many limitations, but the idea is to provide a mechanism to trigger public health investigation into a possible attack scenario that might otherwise go unnoticed. Real-time or near-real-time data from physician office visits or nurse hotline calls can also inform syndromic surveillance systems. In addition, it is possible that dead bird reports or prescription pharmaceutical activity can provide early warning as well. Lastly, while over-the-counter drug sales can give a several-day head start to officials over emergency department visits or physician office visits, online search terms used, if captured anonymously for certain ailments, may give an even greater time advantage. For example, consumers may search for flu symptoms or remedies online far before they actually go to seek care. As you can imagine, given the example list of data sources, syndromic surveillance systems have to deal with trade-offs.
On the one hand, many indicators may pick up serious health risks, but come with the trade-off of identifying numerous false positives. In 2004, the Rand Corporation, a respected research firm, released a report questioning the benefits of syndromic surveillance by providing an analysis of the drawbacks and benefits of such a system. While there are many large syndromic surveillance projects in the U.S., one specific project worth describing in some detail is the Biosense program developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Biosense is a nationwide program that supports early detection of outbreaks by conducting near real-time analysis of existing data from health organizations around the country. The system combines data from ambulatory or outpatient medical visits, emergency room diagnostic and procedural information, as well as clinical laboratory test orders and results and over-the-counter drug sales information. Biosense then uses statistical algorithms to identify anomalies in the data that warrant investigation. Like many syndromic surveillance systems, this system can compare current trends to historical means, moving averages, or seasonally adjusted expected norms to detect a sudden spike in a given indicator. This map from a CDC report displays where hospitals, Department of Defense facilities, and Veterans Affairs facilities are located that contribute data to the Biosense system. The map also displays population density information so that you can get a sense for where health organizations that contribute information to Biosense are located relative to population counts. Biosense was launched in 2003, in the aftermath of 9-11 and the anthrax attacks. As a result, it had a primary focus on bioterrorism and related illnesses. By 2005, Biosense was receiving data from hundreds of hospitals that are part of the Veterans Affairs Systems, Department of Defense Clinics, or local community hospitals. By 2006, data from state health departments began interfacing with the Biosense program, and by 2007, data on anti-infective medication agents, as well as laboratory data from the two largest national laboratory chains were added to Biosense in near real-time access. Adding the lab data allowed for surveillance of such things as West Nile virus. One interesting case study involving Biosense occurred in the fall of 2007. Devastating wildfires affected 20 million people living in Los Angeles, San Diego, and surrounding areas. Because Biosense was already collecting routine health data, it was able to prove very useful in assisting local authorities in making decisions. While the fires burned, the CDC was able to provide local authorities daily reports on health activity related to the fires. For example, large increases in respiratory visits to hospitals were monitored, especially visits for asthma and for visits involving difficulty with breathing. This helped determine the health impact of wildfire smoke on patients with chronic illnesses. More importantly, it allowed officials to direct patients to available services when one or more area hospitals became overwhelmed. Lessons learned helped that particular situation, and in the future, we will be better prepared for wildfire strikes or other large-scale exposures to environmental hazards. In retrospect, this event allowed Biosense for the first time to demonstrate a very useful feature of the system. By providing real-time information to leaders on the ground, Biosense was a key tool in situational awareness, which resulted in improved response to this disaster. 
Just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the wildfires of 2007, here are a few images of the event. This is a satellite photo depicting the smoke plumes blowing west off the California coast. This graph, built with data from Biosense, charts the number of emergency visits with the chief complaint of asthma and the corresponding physician diagnoses for asthma that occurred during the time period of the wildfires. The small diamonds on the trend lines represent days with statistically significant increases in detected events, as flagged by the Biosense Syndromic Surveillance System. The diamonds on the highest peaks of both trend lines correspond to soon after the fires at Witch Creek and Harris started. Incidentally, those days also correspond to when evacuations were ordered. A week or so later, as the rates came back down, wind changes blew the smoke out to sea and the fires were eventually contained. This data highlights the usefulness of a syndromic surveillance system and how it is able to detect spikes in rates of disease. Further analysis of data can easily be done to investigate rates of disease by age group, gender, or time period, as public health officials deem necessary. In late 2011, the CDC launched a redesigned Biosense system dubbed Biosense 2.0. The redesigned system builds on the capabilities of Biosense and includes additional features such as a cloud-based computing architecture. This allows state and local syndromic surveillance data to interface with Biosense. With better management tools, the states can coordinate Biosense with their health information exchanges and other beneficial features, making the system more useful to local public health agencies. While Biosense is one example of a national system, local systems exist as well. In a systematic review of studies reporting on syndromic surveillance systems, Chin et al. identified 20 such systems which have been implemented at the local, county, or state levels. Many of these systems also focus on detecting one or more agents that may be used as part of a biological attack on U.S. soil. Some agents that existing local systems screen for include anthrax, tularemia, smallpox, and Q fever, among others. Anytime large crowds gather temporarily in a given locale, there are potential public health concerns. The temporary and sudden surge of population density at a local event brings potential health hazards including highly communicable diseases and makes for a potentially attractive target for bioterrorism. Therefore, public health officials have used syndromic surveillance systems in conjunction with the Olympic Games. For use in World Cup soccer tournaments. During G8 summits, which have been associated with large demonstrations or, at times, riots. or large sporting events such as baseball's World Series, football's Super Bowl, or horse racing's Kentucky Derby. Syndromic surveillance systems have also been used in pandemics, such as the most recent H1N1 flu outbreak. During the H1N1 pandemic, public health officials were able to chart important developments in how the disease was affecting U.S. citizens. 
In this image, officials plotted pediatric deaths from H1N1 across the U.S. map to determine where children were most likely to die from the disease. This assisted public health decision makers with the development of strategies designed to save lives. In the future, experts expect that syndromic surveillance systems will be able to make better use of clinical data captured by electronic health records. Moreover, as BioSense has shown us during the California wildfires, public health informatics applications will play an increasingly important role in situational awareness and other routine public health practices such as submission of reportable diseases and the tracking of deadly infections like MR. MRSA. MRSA stands for Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus, a dangerous drug-resistant infection. Even though the field of PHI evolved rapidly in response to the events of 9-11, many other PHI applications are easy to conceive. For example, geographic information systems, or GIS, and the use of short message services, otherwise known as text messaging, can play an informatics role in public health practice. GIS is a mechanism that captures, stores, analyzes, manages, and or presents data that are linked to location. Quite simply, it is the plotting of data points on a map so that trends can be examined by geographic location. GIS is a powerful tool that can be used to support the practice of public health. In Birmingham, Alabama, for example, the Jefferson County Department of Health uses GIS to help make decisions about needed public health services. This image of Jefferson County displays data on poverty by region of the county. This and other information can help decision makers make optimal choices. For instance, when the Jefferson County Department of Health needed to assess the best placement of public health clinics, GIS specialists plotted the location of patients' home addresses on the county map to determine the best places for clinics to exist. By taking into consideration minimum travel distances and convenience for patients, officials were able to analyze various scenarios of health center placement and its impact on patient coverage. Ultimately, GIS tools were used to more efficiently and conveniently affect access to care for county residents. Several articles have been published that demonstrate how text messaging can be used for public health purposes. One such study examined patients enrolled in a weight loss program. Patients who received daily texts encouraging them to stay on schedule, eat healthy, and exercise were able to lose more weight. In a separate study, individuals traveling overseas and requiring certain immunizations were more likely to receive their second or third dose when reminded by text messaging to come in several months later when their follow-up visits were scheduled. In another study, women diagnosed with a sexually transmitted disease gave clinicians at a public health clinic the cell phone numbers of previous sexual partners. The men were then discreetly notified by text message to call a number where they were then notified of their possible exposure to the disease. Men who were contacted this way were able to initiate appropriate treatment more rapidly. Clearly, there are some potential ethical and social concerns with some of these practices, but the researchers were interested in testing new PHI applications that may one day be more commonplace if proven successful. Lastly, given that one of the ten essential functions of public health is research, researchers have experimented with ways in which health data can be collected on cell phones with the use of text messaging.
In the future, one could expect PHI applications to be facilitated by access to EHR data and information that is part of Electronic Health Information Exchange, or HIE, programs. Likewise, one could also expect new and innovative PHI applications to take advantage of so-called Web 2.0 technologies, such as social networking systems. This concludes Evolution of Public Health Informatics. In summary, the use of PHI raises some potential ethical, social, and political issues. Ethically, PHI makes potentially private information about health available to public health officials and other decision makers. Such instances as STD notification and even syndromic surveillance information, if tracked with patient identifiers, needs to be carefully considered and governed for the appropriate and legal use of such information. Socially, members of society may not be aware that their information, for example, doctor's visits, may be used for public health purposes. Even though federal laws allow for such uses, public health professionals may need to educate the public and be available to answer questions from concerned citizens. At times, these concerns can become political issues when the nature of surveillance is misconstrued as Big Brother watching. As more and more PHI applications become commonplace, these issues will be debated and reconciled so that the practice of public health supported by PHI can be as efficient and effective as possible.